to drop a link here in the chat to the slides and the information. So really glad to see everyone here. Um, just to give you a little background about myself, my name is, my real life name is Mary Howard and I am a sixth grade teacher. I often say I am just a sixth grade teacher um, in a public school on a pork chop shaped island in Grand Island, named Grand Island, not too far from Niagara Falls, New York. And uh, there I teach um, science and English language arts. And many years ago, I began working with Spiff, who I see is in the audience here. Give him a shout out. Uh, and he was talking to me about this uh, virtual environments and the, the things that we could do with virtual environments. And it really was pretty new to me. And I would say that was probably about eight years ago. But I dove in and I was very curious about what was going on. So I decided to give it a try. And from there, we had many adventures with the virtual environments. We set up some open sim adventures for my sixth graders with the Middle Ages. And um, a couple of those things that we did on those adventures I'm gonna be sharing today. And from there, he gave me some islands to work with to use to supplement my curriculum in a lot of different ways. And so, although I am no expert, I'm sure there's a lot, lot bigger experts in the audience today, um, I have kind of along the way come up with some great ideas, at least I think they're great ideas, and different types of things that I have found work wonderfully with the age group that I teach, but I'm sure can be expanded to a lot of different age groups. So, I titled this Virtual Hunts for Virtual Detectives. And the reason for that is along the way, we uh, did a lot of breakouts in my classroom and I really saw this, this amazing engagement that you can have when you do a breakout or breakout EDU is the trademark name. And those are essentially like escape rooms. So you can you know, bring in a lockbox into your real world classroom, give the students a series of challenges and have them learn content while kind of trying to break into these boxes with different codes and things like that. And it started me to think how great it would be to bring something like that into the virtual world, that level of excitement and that level of, uh, I don't know, engagement. And where virtual environments, most of us know already, have this amazing level of engagement. I thought a little bit of uh, this detective element would be pretty cool. And so that's where a lot of these things came about. When I was working with Spiff, we, uh, you know, every now and then he would just kind of let me run rogue and give different things a try. And uh, that's where some of these ideas came from. So I am going to be sharing four ideas with you today. And I'll do my best to show exemplars from OpenSim and show how it was done. But please, at any time, if you want more detail, if you want to see them firsthand, or if you want even see my planning documents, reach out to me. Twitter is really the best way. Um, it's at Mrs. Howard 118. I encourage you to follow me there. I do share a lot of my instructional musings and experiences that I've had along the way. But uh, we'll go through these four strategies and please feel free, I'm monitoring the chat, so feel free to interrupt if you have any questions. And if you're following along on the Google slide deck, uh, the first thing I'm gonna talk about is called a, a Cardan Grill. And um, this is a, basically a, a cipher, and it was invented by this uh, Frenchman, and I don't speak any French, um, but the last name of the Frenchman was Cardan in um, the 1500s. And it was designed to kind of be what I sort of call a, a peekaboo grid, where he wanted to hide a, a message in an ordinary letter but the recipient is the only one that can really read the hidden message because you have this grid that has holes cut in it and you can sort of see through that grid and it will reveal where the hidden information is in the grid. And I thought, wouldn't it be neat to bring that into a virtual environment? So we were working in our Middle Ages quest and there was a castle. And I thought, you know, there's a lot of space in the basement of this castle. What if I set up some Cardan grills in the basement of this castle? And so I was able to create a texture and upload the texture that had transparent holes cut into them. 
And then I uploaded a series of grids that matched these grills, I guess you would call them, that were see-through. And so when the students drag the object onto the platform and then position it over the grid that you see on the wall, lo and behold, they can see a secret word peeking through. So the example that I'm sharing in the third slide is one of five that the students used in this quest that they went through. And it was a castle quest. I wanted them to learn the different parts of a castle using these uh, secret grids. So the first word that they had to uncover is the word keep. That grid is actually just the answer to a question that's upstairs in our virtual world, and it was in the castle area. So once they found their word, which was keep, they would teleport off to a teleport location, and I'm on slide four of my slide deck, and they would teleport off to a location to answer a question. And when they type in the answer in chat, it would reveal a teleport to a new location and a, and a new question that they'd advance back down to the dungeon, grab the next decoder, the next Cardan grill, hold it up on the next uh, set of letters and find a new answer. And honestly, it was really, really easy to set this up. Um, I used Google Slides, just five by five set of Google Slides to create the grids. As you can see, it's just alphabet letters and in each one of the grids, I hid words. And then when I made the grills, just had to make sure that you could, you know, see through. You had to have it so that there was a peekaboo letter in all the correct spots, uploaded that texture, and then gave it to the students as an object. So that was sort of the first, that was, and wasn't actually the first one I created, but it is one of my favorites because um, I just thought it was truly unique and it really taught the, the students, not just the parts of the castle, but it taught them a lot about building even before we had a chance to teach them how to build. Because with that object, when they receive it, they had to set the object on the ground. They had to position it into place. So it taught them some of the, um, the rudimentary elements of building when it comes to positioning objects, moving them up and down, back and forth, forward and back and um, a lot of the camera controls too, because in order to see through that Cardan grill, in the dungeon like that, they have to have their avatar positioned a certain way or they have to use their camera controls so that's lined up perfectly. So it gave them a lot of embedded skills when it comes to virtual environments, not just the scavenger hunt. So that was our first little uh, foray, one of our forays into scavenger hunts. So then moving on to our next quest, I guess we could call it, or our next scavenger hunt. This one I called the wizard's quest. And I'm on slide six at the moment. What happened here was the kids would teleport into kind of a secret lair called the wizard's lair. And the wizard would challenge them to complete a quest and earn a reward. This was my way of tricking the students into uh, learning or studying the middle ages. So there were a series of questions built into this quest that took them on a scavenger hunt, but actually reviewed with them um, what a fief was and what the feudal system was and the different le levels in the feudal system. So along the way, they would get questions and they would have to answer those questions correctly. And then when they finished answering all the questions, they would return back here to the wizard's lair to answer a secret word. So in the lower right hand corner on slide six, you can see a decoder. And that is another type of cipher that I learned about when doing a lot of breakouts. And this one is called a pig pen cipher. In order to use a pig pen cipher or to decode it, you do have to kind of know how it works. And I'm not sure how many people have seen this before. So I did put in a little pig pen cipher tutorial and that is slide seven. So essentially the pig pen cipher can be set up in a number of different ways. The example slide here shows uh, the, in the top left hand corner, just A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I in a tic-tac-toe board. But if you look at it closely, you can see the letter E has a square around it. And if you look in the lower right hand corner, the word escape has a square around it. So that it's square represents the letter E. And so continuing forward, the letter S in the word escape, if you look around through all four ciphers, you can see that there's an S and it has kind of a V shape underneath it. The C is surrounded by two, a bracket in the shape of an L. The A is a bracket like a backwards L. The P is in a different grid, but there it is with a dot in it. And then finally back to the E again with the square. So as the kids went through this quest, 
they would answer questions I'm on slide eight and if, if they answered the question correctly they would receive a texture and the texture is just an image of one piece of the decoder so they collect all of these along the way so each question they answer they get another piece of the decoder and you can kind of see in slide nine if you're with me that um, this is what their texture would look like it was just a, a google slide where i drew a black line and another black line and imported it as a texture and uh, that was delivered to the students so they, they'd have to save their textures and they have to keep the textures in the inventory and as they went along again they're learning that skill too on how to manage their inventory and how to save items and look at note cards and what textures are and as they collected all of the textures, there were actually seven, they would return to the wizard's lair, and I'm on slide 10, to answer this dark riddle of the ages. The dark riddle of the ages is I tolerate the moon and stars. I can't abide the sun. Banish me with torchlight and you'll see me turn and run. So if you're in the audience and you're not looking at the slides, I'm going to encourage you perhaps to mention in chat if you know the answer to the dark riddle of the ages so can anyone answer the dark riddle of the ages tolerate the moon and stars i can't abide the sun banish me with torchlight and you'll see me turn and run Let's see if anybody knows it Let's see if we have any cheaters that are looking at the slide because the answer is on the slide Thank you. Yes, ding, ding, ding. We have a winner. Thank you, Dodge. The answer is darkness. And let me tell you, the kids get really excited because when they type in the word darkness, uh, it is coded to give them a, a trumpet fanfare, ta-da, and then they receive a note card and they receive an item and they receive a wizard's cap. So they put on their wizard's cap and they roam all around the, the virtual uh, Middle Ages kingdom with their wizard's cap and they feel like rock stars. Uh, but then, then again, for me, my objective was met. I just wanted them to study their Middle Ages terminology. So for that one, the big, the, you know, impetus for that one was getting to use a pig pen cipher and getting Pause again there, because that was strategy number two. They do. They love the swag. All right. And then the next scavenger hunt that is, I've shared this before, but this one is a real hit with the kids. Every single year we do a novel called The Westing Game. And as we finish the novel, I like to bring them into the virtual world to kind of, as a reward, to study and reinforce some of the content in the novel. And so the virtual world that they come into is a mansion. And we try to emulate the Westing Mansion, which is the feature mansion in the Westing game, where one of the characters allegedly dies. And the setting of the story is during Halloween. So you can see on the front porch of the mansion itself, there are pumpkins on the front porch and so it kind of helps reinforce the setting of the beginning and the way this scavenger hunt works is as the students approach approach the front door of the mansion they are searching for these westing dollars uh westing sam westing millionaire and the book was set in the 60s it doesn't sound like much but he, he was a millionaire and his heirs stood to inherit uh, a great deal of fortune so I thought the Westing dollars would be a good way to kind of have the kids, you know, catch these clues throughout the. So when they click on the Westing dollar, it is embedded with a clue. Each Westing dollar has a different embedded within it. And they have to answer these questions on a secret channel. And the channel is channel 76. Why? Because they used to call him Uncle Sam. And Uncle Sam really loved the 4th of July. And so I thought the 76 would be a nice little touch uh, in the channel that they're going to type in. And so they type in the channel 76, the correct information to a question. And each time they answer a question correctly, it gives them a teleport. And so I'm on slide 14, and you can see how they would do that. So they would do 40, uh, forward slash 76 with a space and type in Sandy McSouthers. And being the stickler of an ELA teacher that I am, uh, it doesn't work unless they type it in correctly. So 
character's name has to start with a capital S. The last name has to have a capital M, C, and then a capital S, O U T S. They have to do it correctly. Oh my goodness, the whining. It's not working. It doesn't work. Did you type it correctly? Look at your words. It is pretty amazing to see the these days the lack of discernment skills when it comes to typing things correctly. Gain of an ELA teacher to distance these fact that they they do lowercase I for the word I instead of an uppercase. Like the shift key is an optional key anymore on the keyboard. So um, I really like that feature that they had to have it perfect and they had to have it right in order to get the uh, next clue. They type in Sandy McSouther's name and they get a teleport. So it says they teleport somewhere. Awesome. Slide 14, looking at that. And the awesomeness that they teleport to is that next little um, secret code feature that I thought was pretty awesome, and, and that is a red lens reveal. So each student gets a, literally gets a red lens. It's a piece of cellophane, and they sit at their computers with a piece of cellophane in their And when they teleport to this new location, they'll see a hidden panel or a panel on the screen that's in pink and or cyan and blue and yellow. And when they hold that cellophane up and they put it literally right on the computer screen, it reveals the line of a riddle. And that line of riddle is written in blue, but you can't really see it until you mask out the other colors. And then the blue comes to the forefront and you can see it. So they get the first line to a riddle and then they record that line uh, to the riddle on the little sheet that you can see on the screen there, collect and record each line. So they write down what it says. And then they proceed back to the mansion, explore around again, and trying to find yet another dollar. So as they go through, this is what happens again and again. Answer a question about a character, type it in on the channel 76. If it's right, they get a teleport. They zip on over to another hidden panel, use their red lens to see the answer, write it on their sheet. And as they go along, they collect eight lines to a On their sheet, they, collect, they, they check off each of the characters as they use their names. And eventually, they have to answer a question. In order to answer the final question, they'll know when it's time. They teleport to the top of the Westing Mansion. And if they've solved the riddle, the riddle answer is the word compass. So please don't come to Grand Island's little pork chop and come to my classroom and spoil it for all of them. The answer is the word compass. And when they type that in, we've got a little cube at the top that is scripted to activate their avatar and have it chicken dance. And you know Helena, big shout out to her because she was the one that gave me this script or wrote this script for me so that my kids could chicken dance on the roof of their Westing mansion. And um, they do the chicken dance and they celebrate because they figured it out. Tremendous level of excitement with this project. Uh, this project was featured on a local TV channel um, where they came in and actually interviewed students to see this project in it. That was kind of an exciting moment. Nice shout out for virtual environment. Okay, this was last year or so that was kind of exciting to I'll pause for a minute just in case of any questions along the way. And I am absolutely happy to, to share this material with anybody that might be interested. And even if you're someone who wants to do um, a red lens and you want to just give it a try, um, I have a template that you can use where you can um, adjust Laid out. It, it took me a lot of tries to get the red lens reveal to work, like to, to modify the colors so that it wasn't too bright and you could see through it. Like it was hundreds and hundreds of tries. So I do have a template that you can have to save you the trial and error if you really think you want to try a red lens. But it's pretty amazing. You upload the texture, you can put it on the screen, and they can see the words through. But if they don't have the red lens, it is. And the other thing I did try was I took a red item in the virtual world 
and I changed the transparency of the item. And you can slide um, a slightly less, you know, a, a slightly transparent item in the virtual world over the panel and you can see through it just as though you were using the cellophane lens. Um, the only reason I didn't use that approach is my kids didn't quite have the ability yet to move items in the virtual world. I would go with no on whether it works with color. Into that issue yet with my. Nope, I. <sighs> That's a good question. Okay. Um, the last one here um, is just kind of a little side trip that I took. It isn't really an experience that I've set up per se with my sixth graders. Um, I've done it out of virtual reality, but um, I'm not sure how many of you have heard of the Merge Cube, but this year I've become a, a huge fan of the Merge Cube. And if you're not familiar with the Merge Cube, I do encourage you to kind of take a little side trip and, um, you know, Google it, find out a little bit more about it. Uh, essentially, it is an AR trigger. Cube, which is just a little foam cube, triggers very well with the suite of apps hosted on a site called Mini. Like that in the chat for you, Miniverse. Their website, miniverse.io. And there's a suite of AR apps that work with the merge which is great, but we're more of a virtual, you know, environments group. And so I was experimenting with the Merge Cube and I took a picture of the Merge Cube because it is such a dynamic trigger. And I uploaded that picture as a texture into my open sim because I wanted to test it out to see. Then I picked up my phone and I scanned that image of the Merge Cube and sure enough, it did trigger from the screen onto my phone. And so I kind of had this AR, VR experiment, which was really kind of interesting because um, I didn't think it would work. And then, of course, it did. Uh, so that is always kind of a neat. Something isn't going to work. And, and so what I had created and the thing that I tested with the Merge Cube is my final slide to share with you. Um, and that is that I had created a snow globe in a site called Code Spaces. And the Code Spaces allows you to customize AR experiences on this Merge Cube. And so I put the Merge Cube on the ground, the virtual environment, you can see in slide 19, background, the virtual world. And then I held my phone up to it and sure enough, the picture of me in this snow globe appeared on the screen as though it were in the virtual environment. So I thought it was a really neat thing to be able to do AR, VR. And I don't think there's a name for that yet. Um, but in my head, I thought, wow, this would be a really great way to kind of have hidden AR experiences embedded within a VR sort of scavenger hunt. So that totally will be my next little foray is to come up with some sort of scavenger hunt uh, that goes along with a virtual world with a little AR. So if you wanted to test it out, if you happen to have the CoSpaces app um, on your phone or you can use the link I have on the screen, and I'll put this in chat as well. Um, this link, if you have a phone or a tablet on you, it should lead to, oh, this one up very well. It should lead to this CoSpaces uh, experience, experience, and you should be able to trigger it off your screen, off the slides. So that if you wanted to try that out, you could. It's kind of a neat little, you know, just, Sort of cool. I think that's really all it is at this point. It hasn't really turned into um, an instructional tool as of yet with the virtual environment, but the Merge Cube by itself has turned into a host of experiences that I've been able to do students in the classroom. And CoSpaces EDU all by itself. If you've never used CoSpaces EDU, it is a virtual environment in and of itself. And I've had my students in there a few times this year designing a virtual experience. They've created a virtual world and code that represents the different uh, types of energy. It's mechanical energy. And they created these worlds uh, demonstrating all the different types of energy. So that was a really neat project in CoSpaces. And, and honestly, I probably could and may do the same project in our open sim. I just wanted to try a CoSpaces 
discovered it really is great. They like working collaboratively on another co spaces, but they can't chat. And then they don't like about the co spaces virtual environment is they can't chat with one another. They can chat in real life, but there's no way to send messages to each other or chats in so I really prefer the virtual environment experience sim collaborative build. And they're you know they're av they have avatars, whereas when you're in co-spaces, you're just building. You don't have any identity. Avatar identity is something that at least my sixth graders really genuinely <laughs> enjoy and uh hours of summer. That is really end of the things that I wanted to share with you today.